Welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States. Uh, Mary Rodwell is recognized internationally as one of Australia's leading researchers and writers in the UFO and contact areas. She is the founder and principal of the Australian Close Encounter Resource Network, commonly known as ACERN. ACERN's primary role is to offer professional counseling, support, hypnotherapy, and information to individuals and their families with anomalous paranormal experiences particularly specializing in abduction contact experiences. She joins us now. Welcome, Mary. Hello, Mike. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I've been wanting to have you on here for a while, and I've I've read your most recent book, uh, The New Human, which I have a copy of right here. Uh, it's an excellent book, and you've worked with uh, how many... Uh, Autistic children, have you directly worked with over the over the years? Oh, well, I, I usually say that I'm working with the families, not just the children most sure. of the time. So in terms of numbers, I've worked with about three and a half thousand families or, uh, you know, with children or adults, depending. So around that kind of number. So it, it, it is as a family affair rather than on, on a single basis as such. Okay, and um, these are autistic children, yes? There are a whole range of children that have been, um, if, if you like, their parents have generally been experiences of some kind of contact with non-human intelligences. And one of the things, Mike, that I noticed, and I'm, I didn't ex expect to get into this field where I was going to be supporting you know, the children in this way. I mean, I, I was supporting adults for, for for quite some time that were having experiences. But what I noticed was that each generation of those that had contact as an intergenerational um, pattern that I was seeing time and time again was the new generations of, of children were often seen as dysfunctional um, and given labels like ADHD, Asperger's, autism, dyslexia and what have you. And that intrigued me because why is it that that would be a part of a pattern that those with encounters were having children like that? And and that was what, what initially intrigued me because I discovered then often they're seen as dysfunctional, but actually have other attributes, other abilities, other awareness that isn't always recognized by mainstream science or mainstream psychology, uh, or how we assess what is so-called normal. And, and for me, it was, what is it that's happening when you have parents having experiences, but having children then that were put, were given a lot of these labels? What, what was the connection? Other than perhaps it was something to, related to their experiences and what, what may be going on in terms of some kind of, uh, if you like, uh, way that they have been perhaps assisted to change by these intelligences through genetic manipulation, et cetera, et cetera, or that kind of thing. So, uh, let me, hold on a second. Uh, so, oh God, that's terrible. <laughs> hold on, hold on that's a second. Okay. I, got, I got to increase my lighting. I thought, it, I thought I'd improved it, but actually I made it terrible. So one second and I'll have it all fixed up. So you, um, okay, so they, their parents are contactees or abductees and the children are, um, do you think that the, the, uh, possibly the children were, uh, when the parents a lot of these parents were that the parents were abducted and the children were possibly manipulated genetically uh, right after inception or somewhere before birth to become uh, beings who can now see multiple spectrums of the you know multiverse simultaneously and because the aliens want us to um, move forward and the kids are part of that 
that path. Mike, that's a good overview in the sense that what I was seeing was that each generation that I was talking, you know, talking to, this was um, parents and, and pa the parents of the parents. So getting grandfather or grandmother, because I would say to them, has anyone else in your family um, possibly had some form of experiences? And they'd often say something like, well, granddad was always into UFOs or grandma was a bit psychic or whatever. And it would be an indicator that perhaps that that, it, that was the the well, whether it was maternal or paternal, you know, the paternal side was actually possibly an experiencer, even though it wasn't fully acknowledged. But what I was noticing was a kind of um, upgrade appeared to be going on with each generation of experiencer. So that I w then I was very intrigued that many um, adult fam experiencers were having children given these labels. And I thought that was quite curious to start with, not really fully understanding why that might be. Other than the hypothesis that th what these um, intelligences were doing was trying to um, uh, activate more of the abilities that we, which I believe we all have, are more multidimensional abilities. But with that, they were also, in a way, um, by having those conditions, limiting the programming that may be suppressing those abilities because we do know that with particularly with the western mindset and psychology anything that's beyond the five senses is considered doubtful or um if you like a, a concern whereas really in in terms of us being fully whole we all have the ability to access the non-physical reality, you know, in terms of sens sensitivities. But what happens is as we get educated on this planet, particularly in Western society, much of that awareness is suppressed because it's not considered um, OK and, and often considered a problem or some kind of mental aberration. So I believe that these, these new children coming in that are having these so-called dysfunctions actually prevent them from being reprogrammed into that old mindset, 3D mindset, that is a limiting and limiting way of us experiencing the full spectrum of multidimensional reality. <clears throat> so, okay, so the world, the, the, um, the earth has humans have chosen to primarily um, function in society through the left brain, through the analytical. And these children are either primarily functioning from the right brain or both together. So um, I noticed one of the things you mentioned in the book is that um, you believe that um, that music or sound can change genetics to unlock uh, or, or totally change the genetics themselves to where a person is um, more advanced. So quite a bit of your book gets into genetics. So can you kind of focus in that area a little bit uh, in order to edu educate the rest of us and uh, what you found regarding whether sa how much sound has an effect on the genes of a human specifically? Well, one of the things, Mike, for me, being a former nurse and midwife, I, I'm very interested in the biological side of who and what we are in terms of looking at what some geneticists over the years, particularly Dr. Francis Crick, co-founder of the DNA molecule, he himself always stated in life itself that he believed that we were genetically engineered and intelligently designed, as it were. And there have been many more whistleblower geneticists that have admitted that they have seen anomalies in our DNA. For example, the, the, the second and third chromosome that are fused, for example, is one of the things that 
highlights there's something unusual about Homo sapiens sapiens. The other anomalies have always been that we had the, you know, the Neanderthal and Cro-Magnum um, so-called, you know, humans. And then there's this missing link and all of a sudden out of comes Homo sapiens sapiens with twice the brain size, for example. So that was that is just part of the anomalies in terms of our genetic history. I mean, I, I'm giving an overview here. Obviously, there's a lot more to that. But I have met a number of geneticists, too, that have said that they are very clear that there is something that, that we have within us potential and um, anomalies that will that suggest not only are we intelligently designed, but there are things about our DNA that can be adjusted and changed through frequency. And there are um, some Russian scientists I quote in the book that have done um, a lot of research into how the very configuration of DNA can be altered and changed by human language. So the frequencies of human language can actually alter and change the, this configuration. And in some ways, as a hypnotherapist, I've been very intrigued how that fits into how we can change programming through affirmations, for example, and certain um, types of trance where we can actually alter the way somebody um, operates from, you know, and, and create a new, if you like, um, a new way of expressing ourselves after we have worked on ourselves in some way or another. So th what they noticed was that if that human language, given the right language, can literally change and alter the sequence of DNA. And that fits in a little bit with epigenetics, because we know now with epigenetics that it's not just the genes that control certain things in our body, eye colour and what have you, that our environment can also change through our experience how that that um, the DNA ultimately operates. We might have, for example, a, a predisposition for a certain illness, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we will actually have it depending on our environment and our belief system. All of that also affects how we are ultimately express our genes. So there's a whole thing, number of things that come into play, but the thing that intrigued me, and I'm, I'm giving really a very broad overview here because I, I, I've tried to be a lot more sequential in the book, but what, what I but what I was actually seeing ultimately was that we are only understanding that there's about five to ten percent of our DNA that we are actually um, that is activated. And there seems to be 90 percent that they can't explain what it does. They've got absolutely no idea what it does. And that intrigued me. So what does that mean? What, what, what is it that that other 90 percent actually does? And the understanding is from the experiencer, because I go back to hundreds of experiences talking about how the ETs are, are very interested in our DNA. What is it about our DNA, apart from the fact that they may be part of um, the creation of humanity? The second part of that is what is it about our DNA that's going on? And the new human new generations of human seem to have more activated um, of that dormant DNA than the rest of us. And that seems to express itself in more multidimensional abilities. And we, we, we see that it's happening to people who may very well have it activated through a near-death experience, an out-of-body experience, astral travel, shamanic experience or a kundalini awakening it seems as though that dormant dna may hold the key to an expression of a whole new way of operating in our multi-dimensional world and i believe we all have the ability to do what i'm seeing some of these children are expressing in terms of abilities seeing energy fields seeing beings um, able to communicate with animals for example many of them will articulate they can do that Many of them are, are able to um, see far more of the visual spectrum than we do. Many of them are very, very empathic. And the interesting thing about the music and the frequencies in music is, again, what is it? It's a frequency that seems to activate or appears to activate more of those abilities 
and I've got experiences, so many of them that have come out with strange language, strange, you know, uh, um, intuitive music that seems to activate people into a more a greater awareness of the greater reality that we we can access ourselves if that is is um, act if our dormant DNA is activated in that way and it seems to activate more of those abilities and that awareness through frequency and I mean Nikola Tesla talked about that if you want to stand, the understand the universe look at vibration and frequency so it seems to be the key to activating more of who uh, of our abilities and our awareness and the children are coming in a lot more activated, a lot more aware. OK, so my my hypnotherapy teacher taught me that or one of them, ta uh, my first one taught me that you could talk directly to the cells and you could tell them to let go of various things uh, in the cell itself, memory, cell memory. He was into cellular memory. That's one of the things. Uh, and so the last question I asked you, I'll, I'll go back to it again in a different angle. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that are talking. They talk about various different uh, metaphysical mm -hmm. um, techniques for, you know, changing you in general. And but uh, I'm. I know that you've talked a lot of geneticists. You speak a, a lot about genes in the book, and uh, the children are obviously their genes are more active if they can truly see the the multi spectrum as you as, as many people believe. Is mm -hmm. there somebody that you've talked to that is of a scientific nature as opposed to necessarily pure metaphysical? that has done any documentation about uh, sound making changes to genetics? Is there anybody you can name that you, or let's say if somebody on the street asked you this question, mm. is there a particular person, a scientist you would point to that has, you talking about the two Russians or who, which scientist, if any, has done any research on sound uh manipulation of genes do you know of any can you name one i the only ones i know are the russian scientists that were actually noticing that human language could change the configuration all the science um they work with linguists they work with biologists they work with a whole range a whole team and i i mention them in the book um i, ca I can't pronounce them because I, I never, I'm very bad at pronouncing, but they were my primary source of looking at how um, frequency, which is human language, how frequency actually alters the nature of genes and all the science is there. They're the ones I generally quote. I'd, I'm sure there may be others, but they're the ones that I have reference in the book for that, for that reason, so that people can go and see for themselves. Okay, so uh, there's a number of people, a number of children that have written parts of your book where the child, uh, the mother will um, like quote the child or the ch quotes directly from the children are large portions of various chapters of the book. And uh, there's a boy named Michael, I think, just like me. And uh, there's others, there's certain chapters in there that are really fascinating, even more than the rest of the book, because the kid starts talking about the aliens and, and you know, they get, they get into the uh, details of aliens that a lot of adults don't get that deep or that far into. And uh, so how, what have you learned uh, through the children? What have you learned about the aliens? Uh, you know, Who's who's coming here? Who's uh, who is uh, who is who is controlling the world? Who is uh, trying to, you know, the 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 uh, remote viewers talk about, uh, you know, one group hates us, the other group uh, loves us, and there's a group in the in the middle that doesn't really care one way or the other. There's it's all experiences, you know. Have you come up with any? Uh, cosmological understanding 
surrounding aliens who are interacting with the earth based on your interaction with the children and their parents? It's a good question. And all I can do is give you an overview of where I'm getting corroboration over a number of children or adults or whatever. There seems to be an extraordinary number of different forms of intelligence, uh, intelligences interacting with this planet at the moment. The standard ones, I know that we get more and more um, whistleblower material. If it's the whistleblowers, one of the recent ones I was listening to, saying nine to five, 95 percent of intelligences that are visiting this planet are benevolent and there's about five percent are self-serving i don't know about that but what i will say is what seems to be interesting is when the surveys that we did with the dr edgar mitchell free foundation uh, out of 4200 people what we discovered was that 56 percent saw humanoids then there was something like 53 percent saw the small greys and then it went down to the taller greys and many other different forms from mantis beings to reptilian beings to um, light beings, angelic type beings, a whole range of beings. If I go to where I am now, I've got a little story um, that I'll be showing at a presentation uh, very soon of a family that are all experiencing right down to the nine year old girl there's a whole family of seven of them they're all experiencing different types of beings and the, the 17 year old has drawn about 250 images of different intelligences that she has connected to and they all have been drawing different ones so we've got the standard ones which i think that have gone around the globe you know that i've just mentioned tall greys short greys blue beings bird-like beings um, a whole range of those but there seems to be more and more experiences that are seeing other forms of beings as well. There are some more, more common patterns or whatever. But for me, the interesting thing is what is their agendas? Why are they visiting us? What is it all about? And what was so great about the survey that we did in the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation was when we asked about their interactions, ultimately 85% said they had a psycho-spiritual transformation and only 15% were in fear and, and saw it as negative for them. And that, I think, gives us a, a far better idea of perhaps some of the agendas, at least, of these interactions with these intelligences, more than anything else, because there's no other survey that's done, you know, um, 10 countries globally with 4,200 individuals other than this particular survey that's in, in the book Beyond UFOs. So if anyone wants... and 600 questions were part of this survey. So we, what we were trying to do was to get a, a far more overall understanding. And this is all conscious recall. Um, this wasn't through hypnosis. This was, and that I think for some people gives it a certain credibility um, that it, it, it was their conscious recall. So in terms of the, the getting back to your question, the, the primary um, information now that I'm getting is there's multitudes of, of intelligences that people are seeing with all different forms. And unless they're using screens for all these different forms, which is possible, um, we're, we're getting an, an extraordinary variety of intelligences that are interacting with our planet at this time. Okay, so I'm familiar with the family you're referring to. I have seen the mother, um, her interviews, with you and with other people. And um, I haven't seen so much of the children, a little bit. They they have interacted with you on some very short interviews, but yeah. I don't think the parents want the children to be necessarily, I think they're probably protecting them just like any other parent would. Uh, uh, the first thing I would say is next time you talk to the little girl who uh, draws the large number, largest number within that family. Please tell her I would love to have her on my show. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, okay, so the general population. Okay, so let's go back to the free report for a second. 
So one thing I know, one thing I read about the free report re very recently that I had never seen before uh, was it stated something to the effect that uh, there are actually more um, people who have interacted with aliens who are not abductees than abductees. And co the common knowledge among abductees is that everybody who's had alien experience is an abductee. And those of us who are contactees mm -hmm. don't exist. We're not real. We're just play pretending to be, uh, you know, contactees. Yeah. We're really abductees. We just don't know it. And so... <laughs> Uh, I think the family you're referring to, I don't, I don't remember any of the members of that family ever stating they were ever taken on board. So that family alone is an example of a, a group of people that is in contactees and not abductees. Now, if the free report is saying that there are more contactees than abductees, that would mean people like myself are in the majority, not the rare exception. And so anyway, uh, having said all that, I, um, I, I see that the children of that family through their parents' genetics and so forth are more open to contact with intelligences in general. And I think the fact that the, the particular young woman that you're referring to has had so much is able to draw so many different beings is because she is open more far more open than the average person even more open than the average contactee or abductee so therefore you have that's where you're getting all the varieties because mm -hmm. you're run, running across rare people like the little girl who is more open to these contacts Therefore, you've got a whole variety of beings as opposed to the rest of us who are just, you know, like, for instance, myself, I had uh, my one of my encounters with was was with beings that if you saw them walking amongst us, there's mm -hmm. no way in the world you would ever know they were not an average human because yeah. visibly they looked exactly as we do. So. Mm -hmm. We don't really know how many of them are there are among us. That's where we make assumptions that they're not among us. And I don't think that's the correct assumption to make. So anyway, uh, I have to come up with another question for you. So uh, what um, I have to think about this for a second, which direction we should go in. So um, I guess the, the area that I would like to get into next is the children you've worked with see multidimensionally and therefore they have given you and us through your book uh, a lot of information about multidimensionality or the multiverse that, mm. you know, we the rest of us, we see it in movies and they mm. see it in their everyday life. So the question comes down is, uh, you know, what have they, how have they enlightened you, at, if at all, about the other dimensions that are overlapping this one that they're able to pick, at, see without, you know, even, even people like the little girl that you're referring to, she only sees glimpses of the larger mm -hmm. world, but the, the, the autistic children she, I don't think she's autistic. The autistic children see the full multidimensionality every day, all day. It's a totally different level for them. So I'm always curious as to what understanding, like beyond ETs, beyond what the ETs want and this and that, what is it about the overlap of the other dimensions that is that the children have learned that have they passed to you and that you have passed through your book uh, in small part. What, what, is, what is it the children have taught you about multidimensionality in general, if anything? Well, I think what working in this field has done for me um, and my research 
is given me what I would say is a lot more of the tangibility to other realms than, and and um, other dimensions and what have you. When you get a 10 year old that tells you that he came through a portal in the sun, which sounds extraordinary, but we are now getting images of what appear to be some kind of things um, coming um, around the sun. We're seeing strange objects and what have you, which suggests it may very well be a portal. So I'm constantly looking at where we might have evidence of what I'm hearing from the children. What is fascinating about the children is many of them have memories of past lives. And, you know, one of the young 10 year old that I remember describing to me that he was a blue being in another life. It's his first incarnation on on this planet. And he's come here, as he calls himself, a center seed to connect with the planet, to help with, with his mandate, which is the pollution on this planet. And he can see interdimensionally without trying. It, it is part of his ability to do that. He's aware that he can um, do healing. He, he is aware that certain language frequencies he uses can actually create healing and whatever. Now, this is a 10 year old. The interesting thing that I want to say here is that often when I talk to the parents to find out, you know, where how much may have come from them in some way or another, many of them have said, absolutely not. This is something that they have delivered to them quite spontaneously and quite um, in a very, very normal way. You get a, an eight year old and I remember this little eight year old drawing herself as a water being on another planet. She said in this other planet she was on, she was a water being and she drew what she looked like there. But she says now she's a hybrid. She's part water being, part human. So she's aware that she's bringing certain um, parts of her other life into the being that she is now. In other words, awareness that she had as a water being or whatever, and explaining some of her abilities and her awareness. These are things and concepts that, you know, um, are, are very spontaneous. They come out very, very much in a matter of fact way or whatever from, this is just two examples. One young man of seven explained how he goes to other planets in other dimensions. And he said that what he does is he uses the runes because he, he said they can be a portal as long as you know the mathematical number of the planet in the other uh, in the other realms or other dimensions. All you need to do then is to use that as a portal and the number is the frequency for you to connect to the other planet. So, again, these are concepts that really, to me, are quite incredible in small children. And, you, you know, when you ask for details, they'll give you more details. I also recall an eight year old from the US who was very excited and she'd had experience two nights previously being taken on board craft and being shown how to use her, her psychic abilities because on board craft, many of them say they're taught how to use their consciousness to create things, to use, um, to um, understand the nature of multidimensional reality. So many of them are educated and how to use their abilities. Um, in other realms, whether it's on a craft or even taken to a planet and shown how to do this. And this eight year old explained to me that she was also shown genetic engineering, that they were actually showing her how they seed other planets by mixing certain genetics of different indigenous species so that 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 can then seed another planet, either in this reality or in another dimension. So for them, this is this is part of their extraordinary um, extracurricular education that they're given from these intelligences. So, you know, you put this all together and, and you're finding there's something very compelling about the way they describe their understanding of reality, the dimensions. Many of them talk about, you know, different timelines and, and many also talk about coming from other um, other planets and in past lives. And they seem to be awake to this even very early on as a as a young child um their biggest difficulty sometimes and I, and it's a pattern that i've noticed that a lot of the younger children these days don't always want to talk too early and it, it came as a possibility that's because they many of them are telepathic and they expect to talk to you telepathically 
so they don't expect to have to talk. And one of the most interesting stories was a young man who told me when he was a child, he used to talk telepathically to his sister until one day she told him to stop being lazy and start talking because they were communicating telepathically. So I, I'm always looking at where where can I connect the dots here? Is the patterns that I can look at? What are they suggesting? Because a lot of this, you know, obviously is a hypothesis. I can't ap absolutely categorically say this is this. But what I find is that when I'm looking at that, often it seems to make sense to those that I'm speaking to. And the interesting thing with all of this, Mike, is that I, you know, when I wrote The New Human, I never expected it, you know, I expected it to meet a certain um, uh, metaphysical circles, for example, or ufological circles, maybe a, a little bit of mix of, of both. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I've had educators contact me. I've had clinical psychologists contact me and say to me, I'm seeing these children. Um, I'm seeing the differences and I'm aware that this is what's going on for them, but I can't always tell the parent. So it's not just the parents getting in contact. I'm getting professionals that are noticing these differences and realizing these children are different. I always remember um, listening to an autistic girl and she was asked the question, why don't you ever look in somebody else's eyes? You know, you're always looking down, you, you're, you're avoiding looking at me in the eye or whatever. Why? Why, why? why do you do that? And she said to the um, lady asking the question, it's because I will see a thousand images all in one, one moment if I look in your eyes. So she's tapping into something incredible in her awareness when she is connecting in that way to someone. And I think part of the issue for me is if we understand how they experience reality, we can then reach them and work with that. And it also will help us understand how different people experience reality. And one of the interesting clues for me was working with Neil Gold, who's an experiencer in Hong Kong, when I went over there to meet him and speak to the groups in Hong Kong. And he wrote Close Encounters of the ADHD Kind. He had had interactions with light beings. And he said to me, it was only in my 50s I realized I would have been diagnosed as ADHD because I always saw more of reality than it appeared other people did. And I didn't realize, I just thought I was strange or different. And he, he actually retranslate that now into always dialed into higher dimensions because I believe they're working, the ADHDs are a higher frequency. So they're working on a higher frequency. And we don't understand that because we think that they're dysfunctional because they can't focus on what we want them to focus on, which is a program that doesn't fit for them. So what we do is we slow them down with medication or something so we can program them into the 3D reality when they're, they're in fact operating on a higher frequency and are seeing far more of the greater reality than the rest of us that have been dumbed down. And I do think we've been dumbed down. Um, and a lot of that is the programming that Western society is is operating from, whereas you get indigenous um, individuals that are part of the indigenous um, part of our planet that are still operating in the way that we should be operating too, which is far more in balance with our multidimensional awareness. <laughs> I get the impression that the autistic children are um, reincarnations of beings that are not just from alien worlds or aliens in the past lifetimes, but also beings of a higher nature, higher level. Uh, you, you wonder, you know, how much power a gray or a reptilian or whatever from this level has, uh, how much they can perceive, but more than us. But, you know, it, it appears that the autistic children that you've uh, kind of zeroed in on, it seems like they are reincarnations of, pe of beings that are from a higher level that that is 
where the beings at that level are naturally able to perceive much more than just the physical. So what I'm thinking is that they're the they're examples of the first aliens that we can't kill on Earth that, you know, that are, you know, none of them we can kill because they're all beyond us in all in all the levels. But my point is, is that you have uh, beings living amongst us, mm. uh, which we call autistic children that have abilities the same as or similar to beings of a higher level they couldn't exist physically in bodies on this earth because they're from the fifth, sixth, or seventh, or whatever dimension that that naturally can perceive all these multi dimensions. So, what you're seeing is you're seeing a human that has the abilities of a higher level being. You get my drift, right? Mm. Uh, I know it's more of a statement than a question, but yeah. it seems like the aliens. Are the, the aliens from higher levels are finally incarnating on Earth as another level, another step towards our advancement. Because they're, I, they're opening yes. us up to these other realms because they see it naturally and because they came from those realms, those yeah. higher realms. It's where those they get those abilities from. You get, you if, if I, yeah, Mike, if I had, you know, Say, mention a hypothesis here is the way that I've come to understand it when I've talked to so many that are actually very comfortable with their interactions as you are with being contactees they see themselves as coming from those star origins they may say I'm not from here that my home is it could be Andromeda it could be another dimension for example some have talked about coming from other dimensions what I have seen is that they um, have said on a soul knowing or a, a deeper awareness that they've come in to help with the, uh, um, if you like, the acceleration of human consciousness on this planet. They are part of that plan to activate the rest of us into a higher consciousness as well, because we all have those abilities and they have undertaken that mission. It almost like their mandate. What's your mission? They'll say my mission is to. Um, work as a healer or work as um, as someone who is going to um, assist others to um, wake up or whatever they may have merit some say they've come to help with the ecology of this planet for example and whatever but they're bringing in their skills from other dimensions other levels of awareness that they you know that they have know they've got the abilities to assist on some level with helping this happen on planet earth and yes some of them have certainly come from higher realms as well one of the one of the interesting stories that i don't know whether you recall in the new human is a young man who is an artist and he didn't realize when he was a child why he kept getting these visions of soldiers in the world, first world war and um visions of of what had happened to them and whatever it was only later he realized that he was actually this was a past life of his and he was one of them that he had seen in in his dreams what he discovered was that in a he had come in in that life um to bring in information to activate perception and consciousness but had been killed in the war so what he he actually then realized that he reincarnated this time to create the artwork, which he said activated perceptions. So when you looked at it, it activated more of your awareness and what have you. So he was aware that he'd failed the last incarnation because of the war where he'd gone into the war and got killed. And now he deliberately reincarnated again so he could produce this artwork, which many, many experiences are doing, is all this in incredible artwork, which acts as some kind of perfect, um, perception activator so that we can actually see more and more of our greater reality. So it's coming in through frequencies, through music, through symbols, through star language, through art, a whole range of different ways these frequencies are coming in, which I believe is activating the dormant DNA of humanity and and this is how it's it's happening is through all these different 
uh, different frequencies that are being brought in by these new generations of human and even the earlier generations and older models, as I call myself. <laughs> sure, you'd understand that, you know, that we've all got a mandate that is part of that. So how do you, um, being as free, okay, so free is on one end of the spectrum. People like, um, like Daryl Sims, are on the other end of the spectrum. On one end, you've got the aliens are positive. Most aliens are positive. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got people like Daryl who believe that most aliens are not positive. So obviously, you're more on the positive side. I understand that. But uh, OK, so a lot of people, the second level of that question is a lot of people are waiting for the aliens to save us. And then other people are saying, no, the aliens are never going to save us. It's re it's required for each civilization to save itself. And so we, a lot of people think that or believe, like I do, that that humans have live have risen to much higher levels than we are now and died on Earth over and over and over. Mm. So I guess th here's where the question is: is this, um, you just mentioned uh, during our conversation a couple different children who were tasked with dealing with ecology. So my question comes down is, having said all that, do you think humans will survive this time as opposed to the other times? Do you think we'll, do you think we'll break the shell and hatch into the chicken who can fly? <laughs> or do you think, you know, we're we're at a point where we have most people recognize that the human race has polluted this world very close to the level where it cannot be if not beyond the level where it will ever be cleaned up of course the aliens have the technology cleaned up in days but they're not going to help us unless we come to uh, a level where we are worthy of being helped if we're you know, nuking each other or, you know, yeah. still constantly killing each other, we're never going to, if we keep focusing down that path, mm. you get, you kind of get my question, right? I do. What I would say, Mike, first of all, is my understanding from the experiences is that they're not going to fix it for us. But what they have done, I believe, is make sure some of their own have been incarnated into human form to actually assist us to fix it. So that in other words, you know, when you get individuals, and I, I mean, I've talked to hundreds, when you ask them, they'll say my origin isn't on this planet, that my origin is actually on a particular, I come from another dimension or I come from, you know, Pleiades or whatever it is, they're already having a sense of their origins. And what I believe these intelligences are doing is sending some of their own to incarnate into human so that they can use their awareness and abilities and their connection to those intelligences to make a difference on this planet. And that is what we're seeing with a lot of the awakened children who are saying, you know, my last li lifetime was on Orion or on in the Pleiades or another dimension or whatever. So that in itself is one way that they're helping. The other way they're helping is to, you know, many of experiences are downloading information, scientific information, information on our true history, information on um, a, a range of uh, areas of knowledge, which they're bringing through and writing about and including um, technology such as free energy, the ways of dealing with pollution, all these things that we're needing are being given through um, this kind of telepathic download that so many are having and they're experiencing and putting this out there. And for everyone that doesn't reach a source to use it, there are others that are doing that. And there are many, many now getting information on a multiple level of not only the true history of who we are, but the real nature of the multiverse, for example, the um, information about new technologies that will help this planet. So that that's how they're helping. And that is very clear to me that this is th their, their um, more subtle way 
if you like, of changing what's going on on this planet and helping with consciousness and what have you and giving people experiences where they can see for themselves. The interesting thing is that they will help even a very tangible way. What we discovered in the surveys was 50 percent of those who had experiences had healing on board craft. And I had a, a lovely email from a lady in England who was a healer. And she was um, she said, I didn't know anything about aliens. She said nothing to do with them. Never heard of them. I'm, I work as a healer, as an energy worker. And she said, and I was working with a particular lady. And for some reason, whatever I was doing wasn't making any difference. And she said, and then I had this weird experience where me and this lady were taken up on board craft. They showed me working on her and showed me how that they were doing the healing. And they put us both back. I was freaked out because I've never had anything like that happen before. And the woman was actually healed. And she said, and now I realize that some of the spirits that I thought were sp just spirits and, you know, helping me, you know, with um, angelic beings were in fact non-human intelligences and whatever. So we've got all of this going on that a lot of the public is not aware of. In, and, and very beneficial to to who um, to who they are and why they're trying to help us because and people say well why would they bother to help us or anything and I'm saying because it seems like we are genetically related to them at least it appears there's at least 12 different species that are interacting or have added their own DNA to us. And, you know, that beautiful ufologist, um, Robert Dean, you know, be, um, which was a beautiful gentleman, uh, Command Sergeant Robert Dean, who has been, I think, a figure in ufology that very few could ever say was anything other than full of integrity when he talked about the reality of UFOs and what have you and his own experience on board craft, ultimately admitting he was an experiencer in his latter years, said that he'd sh been shown on craft that um, there were at least 12 different species that were involved in creating Homo sapiens sapiens. And he also said something which I've never forgotten because I found it really very, you know, you talk about what's the future for humanity. He said they told him that we were going to go through a very difficult time. But ultimately, he said, they showed me the future. And he said for humanity and it's glorious. So you can take that for what you want. But I do believe that many of these children coming in, these new generations of children with their awareness, they haven't come in for a waste of time because they would know whether or not it was worth incarnating on this planet or not because of, of their awareness. So they must know that there's a reason and a good reason why they've come to help at this time and, and to help with what I'm seeing very much through my work. I've never been so busy is how many people are being activated and waking up more to their multidimensional awareness from all walks of life right across the planet, you know, and it doesn't really matter what culture, what belief system or whatever, they are uh, finding themselves being activated into more of an understanding of the greater reality, getting involved in healing, getting involved in the environment, getting involved in a whole new philosophy of how we're all connected. Many even talking and, and communicating with plants and with animals. One of the interesting ones was a, a wonderful veterinary surgeon in Chile who I talked to some years ago. And she said, Mary, I've decided I'm just going to come out and say this, she said. But since um, over the last few years, I've realized that I can communicate the pets, what's going on with the pets to their owners. And she said, and not just the pets that they bring to me, but the ones that have moved on. I can actually communicate with them and pass that on to the to the families and what have you. This is a veterinary surgeon working in Chile who has got no problem with admitting that this is what she believes now that she can do. This is what I'm seeing. And this is why I feel very hopeful that we're going through an enormous transformation of human consciousness and activation of that that's leading to a whole new, I believe, paradigm. Sounds like you're optimistic. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's a good thing. Um, I once had an argument with a, 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 a an abductee. I'm a, I'm a contactee, and the girl I was having an argument with uh, is an abductee. And we were walking out of a MUFON uh, meeting in Austin, Texas one day, many years ago. 
And she, she looked at me and she said, you know, aliens run the planet, right? And I said, no, disincarnates run the planet. And she goes, no, aliens run the planet. And we went back and forth like two little kids uh, saying the same thing over and over. Eventually I stopped and I said, okay, okay, you win. Aliens run the planet. And guess who runs the aliens? It's disincarnates. <laughs> so I win. Anyway, uh, having said that, hey, uh, I know that you're more on the more positive side. Do you give any credence to the notion that uh, that like like archons or uh, you know that there are negative yeah. aliens that are running the planet? Does that does that theme strike any truth in you, or do you think that's total fiction? I absolutely think it's truthful. And the reason that I say that is I'm looking, I mean, you know, the, the fascinating thing is you get involved in this particular phenomena and it opens you up to so many areas of human knowledge because you're trying to connect the dots from anthropology, archaeology, biology, science, physics, um, religion, theology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I look at what's happening to this planet right now, and I look at the programs that I'm seeing that I think are very dark for, for this planet. And dark to the point of really dark. And I have looked at the, the theories, uh, and I'm not sure they're theories, um, that the what I've heard from various whistleblowers, various people, that have had experiences with particularly the reptilians, for example, who say that they were here before us as humans and that they they this was their planet. But ultimately, humans did end up on this planet as well. And a lot of the reptilians apparently went underground. This is one one scenario. But they um, still didn't want to lose control. So the understanding was they created human reptilian hybrids in certain bloodlines, particularly. And it's these bloodlines that are still ruling the planet. That sort of, the, there's a bit to that that feels like it could very well be the case, given the fact that we have got bloodlines that have continually um, ruled this planet over many, many centuries. So I don't, I don't see that as particularly bizarre other than, you know, when some, when we talk about hybrids, we're all hybrids. When people say to me, well, the hybrids are taking over the planet. Well, we have taken over the planet because I believe we're all hybrids anyway. But there are upgrades of hybrids and there are hybrids of different species. But there's also hybrids of the reptilians. And I've met some people that have identified as human reptilian hybrids. And actually, some of them have been really lovely, <laughs> you know, as people um, and what have you. But they're also saying there have been others created that are not so lovely and are part of these bloodlines. And if that's the case, um, it suggests that the, some of our bloodlines that have been ruling this planet for eons are not perhaps so beneficial to the average human. And um, we're seeing things go on right now and, and certainly over the last century or more that may very well say that they are trying to control the population of this planet. They're trying to control humanity and they're not our best friends. And that would definitely connect to a background of one of the reptilian agendas. Although I will say that I've heard of some reptilians that are very, that are not like that. And one of them um, particularly in, um, was interesting was um, Barbara Lamb, a wonderful researcher and hypnotherapist like myself, who many people will know, recounted to me, and I know she's recounted it to others as well, was when she went in her lounge room once, there was a seven foot reptilian standing there that exuded nothing but love. So she said, you know, there are some that without doubt are doing the same as humanity and trying to evolve into a more um, loving, compassionate um, uh, entity, if you like, or soul. Um, so some of them, I think, may very well be trying to um, evolve in the same way as humanity, but there are still those that do, are not our friend and are behind a lot of the ruling classes of, of this planet that at the moment have a very dark agenda, I believe, 
to wipe um, certain popular uh, the amount of population out. And I do think those are dark forces. And I do think it's quite possible that they they are also controlled by interdimensionals as well. Who knows for sure? But I wouldn't dismiss it. How can you dismiss anything, Mike, when you don't know what you don't know? <laughs> you know, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm like everyone else. I'm trying to join the dots and you get bits of information and you wait to see if it feels right or if it resonates or if you can get more data on that that may sol you know consolidate that particular possibility or whatever but it's got to be you know it's got you've got to be adaptable haven't you on this planet because you're getting all sorts of different kinds of information all the time from different sources and it's well what resonates what feels right to me is is that appearing more credible than that does that fit with everything else I'm trying to understand. So as far as I'm concerned, I can't say an absolute about anything because I would be very foolish to say, well, I believe it's this or it's this or it's this. I can say, I can hypothesize that some things are leading me into this direction at the moment, but I absolutely feel we are being manipulated by some unseen or not, uh, uh, not, oh, sorry about that. Uh, sorry, I'll have to, sorry, I'll just decline that. Sorry about that. Um, so for me, it's it's about um, understanding that we don't know what we don't know, Mike. And for me, it's all about the journey and trying to learn. And and uh, from what the data is saying is, is certain things could be a possibility. So getting back to that, I think it's quite possible we're, be, we're being controlled by a force at the moment that's not necessarily benevolent. As a hypnotherapist, I know you've worked. Uh, do you typically, as a hypnotherapist, work with the autistic children or the parents or both? Oh, usually with the parents. Um, there are children of a certain age that I will work with, um, depending on what's going on. But most of the time, I don't need to do hypnosis. With many of the children, they already have conscious recall of, of a lot of the information. I mean, everything that I wrote about in The New Human, for example, was in fact conscious recall from them. None of it was actually me taking them into an altered state. And, you know, I did that deliberately because, you know, there's always the question mark over any trance state or whatever, even though Dr. John Mack, as you know, was a Harvard professor of psychiatry that actually believed that information gained through hypnosis often was a lot more accurate than conscious memory because we edit out things that we don't feel, um, you know, in, in the conscious state, we edit out things we think will not be accepted or we, we're not very good at acknowledging. Whereas in hypnosis, you've, you're not, you've not got that filter so that in fact, often it's a, it has a lot more integrity through hypnosis, I believe, than it does with conscious recall. So having worked with the parents who are abductees um, or contactees, either one, um, during the these sessions you've had with so many people, have you ever come across any beings that spoke through the... Uh, the client who was in the state of trance, why you had them in hypnosis, has that ever occurred even once for you? It's happened numerous times. And um, and it, they will identify themselves either as a guide or a source, a spiritual source, or they'll identify an aspect of themselves called their higher self. And, and one of the questions that if they're seeking answers from another deeper part of themselves, I will ask if I can speak to the higher self. And the higher self will then talk a lot more independently of the conscious um, part of their personality and give them information or understanding about things. So that is not unusual. Well, um, I've worked with clients. Um, my teacher never told me about the higher self. I had to discover that through my own practice as a hypnotherapist, but um, I really was not referring to the higher self. I was referring to whether aliens spoke that mm. that were, you know, the ones 
in contact with the particular client you're working with if the yeah. aliens ever spoke directly through the client directly yeah so tell tell us about go through one or more any of those uh conversations you had that you know you don't have to get specific being you know these are your clients but if you could just give an idea of what the aliens said that would be notable that would be interesting i think oh look um there's there's quite a number they would introduce themselves and why they're working with that particular individual sometimes for most part the the ets that were speaking through them is actually giving the person themselves some information about what they needed to know about themselves often it's you know it's a personal message but they they will um uh, mention sometimes connections to them and why they have come through is because they're connected on a soul level with that particular individual that has um, perhaps incarnated from that particular star system or origin and saying why they've agreed to perhaps come in and agree to, to a certain mandate or mission on the on this planet so usually it's to help the person um, integrate more of their connection to a particular star system or a particular mandate or mission that they they are talking about so um that's that's primarily what what i will get when there's there's a lot i mean i could go off in a number of different directions with that but primarily it is it relevant to the individual um that they're coming through to give them information about their own personal journey and their understanding of maybe anomalies that where they've um, wanted to know more about the encounters that they've had or the experiences they had or something to do with what they've come here to do as a mission or or their purpose on this planet. Have any of the aliens that spoke through those clients of yours ever had a message for you? Yes, occasionally. They generally tell me I'm doing a good job. <laughs> One of the things is that um, that you know that I'm to continue what I'm doing, um, that I'm helping a lot of people who are you know waking up and what have you. Um, so generally it's been it's been very positive and and what have you um i suppose that's all i can say is that it's always been pretty positive so aside from the aliens speaking through your clients to you have you ever uh had your own direct encounters i've had no conscious recall of any any encounters on board craft or anything else although i will add to that that certain people have said they've seen me up there so i don't know obviously um i've got no conscious memory but i will say this i do tap into that kind of communication and have done for a number of years so can you elaborate what, what you mean what you just stated uh, it sounded well, very interesting but it was very vague too well, yes. Um, all I can say is part of my own awareness I worked with in an, for a number of years to be able to connect to certain information from various intelligences. So, and it was something I didn't realize I could do, but I realize now that everybody can. They just don't know or understand how it works. Well, I learned how it worked and it's been something that's been very valuable to me in helping me with my with understanding what's going on because if i don't fully understand i can sort of put that out there and ask about it and i will get information that will help me understand certain things or help me connect the dots and what have you and i often help others to do the same because it's not it's not rocket science. It just means you've just got to be more open to that intuition, that knowing, that sensing, that feeling, and allowing yourself to honor that brings more of that ability to you so that you can actually start to get your own answers and connect to the, the intelligences that I think support us all. Every one of us has, I think, a team, a spiritual team that, that guides us and helps us as well as our connecting to our higher self or you know um our super conscious whether you want to see it as your higher self creating those intelligences and um as as it could be 
or in fact you are um, you feel them all as separate intelligences with different energy fields and different frequencies that are connecting with you because you're open and ready to be a receiver telepathically. So do you remember, can you recall the very first time you ever had, um, I get the impression, okay, so people talk about downloads and they also talk about what you're talking about where you're reaching out and getting whatever you need. So I guess my question that it seems like it w the answer, if you got very specific, could be very interesting, would be, do you remember the very first time you ever did what you just talked about? And if you could recall um, either exactly how it happened or what you did that led up to your ability to do it the first time so that you might give the audience some type of um, insight as to how they could do it themselves well to encapsulate what i call my three years of training i was in a group of individuals two of them were believe it or not clinical psychologists one of them was a nursing sister one of them was a naturopath one was trans medium i was invited to the group to um because this particular facilitator had told by her connection that she needed to train some professionals in opening up to more of their multidimensional awareness. And so I was very fascinated because I've always been interested in that, you know, the spiritual realm. I, you know, did hypnosis in past lives and whatever. So I had no problem in believing that we have intelligences that are maybe not physical, um, doesn't mean they're not there. So I was always open to that, but I didn't realize that what we were going to do everybody could do it that i thought only certain people could do it i believed it was you had to be gifted or something so i that was completely dissipated after a first few times because after our we did meditation and this lady through her team or her guides would then assist each one of us to to connect to who we believe to be our gatekeeper or guide or whatever and I remember the first time that I did it these words just came out of my mouth that I had no conscious thought about and I was so blown away by it I, I thought it was an anomaly to, to put it bl bl bluntly that something was just I was just you know one of those things coincidence synchronicity whatever name the trouble was that it kept happening that um, when I was in a more relaxed state I would feel a presence and then these words would just be in my head that I had no conscious thought. There was no way of making anything up because I hadn't got to that point before the words were there. And so what I found myself doing was just saying, saying them and hoping they weren't a load of rubbish because I didn't know what I was going to be saying. And I realized then how that you work through three years of training. We did everything from psychometry, energy work, uh, connecting. I had experiences where I was overshadowed. Um, where my consciousness was moved to one side and um, a spirit would come through and speak to to someone. And that that threw me um, a little bit to one. I was really quite conflicted with that to start with, but I realized it was just an overshadowing experience. So what it enabled me to do ultimately was to isolate who it is I'm, that was giving me information, who they were, why they were with me, how they helped and verifying the information was really important. So I learned how to do it. And I believe everyone can learn how to do it. I think it's just been suppressed by society and by the what is considered the norms that you're not allowed to feel safe when you access information that is given to you through that means, through different intelligences that know exactly how to give you information. And that's where the downloads come from. That's where Often um, when people get, you know, these a lot of these symbols and what have you, they're getting it from these intelligences that are, are giving it to them telepathically. Well, for me, it's a similar process. All I do is make sure I don't engage my left brain. And so if I'm having a communication, they will just give me information. Everyone can do it. It's perfectly normal. It's just that it's been made out to be abnormal. And so some of my work is showing people how to do it. 
So I can actually show someone how they can do that safely and comfortably without any fear whatsoever. And all it really is, is, is sh switching how you operate with your left and right brain. So in other words, I would say to somebody in your left brain, you think before you speak. In right brain, you speak before you think. So it's the complete reverse. And that's how you operate in a, a multidimensional um, way where you're grounded in 3D, but you can actually go from one to the other. And once you know the difference, it's it's as easy as breathing. It's There's nothing magical about it. And I know many wonderful people that have, you know, written stories that have got PhDs in astrophysics and all the rest of it that are doing this without saying that that's what they're doing. And I know many um, from lawyers to um, those right from across the cultural spectrum that are doing this, but don't talk about it. But it's actually part of who we are. Everyone can do this. It's just that it's been, we've just been told it's not okay to do it because that stops, um, that, that prevents those that want us to believe a certain thing from accessing our own information. So anyway, I after three years, I then trained two groups for two years. I call that my apprenticeship. And now I assist people if they want to find answers, they can either do it through hypnosis or they can do it by accessing their own source of information, which they can see as the higher self, their super conscious, or they can see it as different intelligences that are supporting them through this life, whether they see them as spirit guides, angels, or a uh, light being, whoever. So I've had my higher self speak through me spontaneously without uh trying and it sounds like you're talking about something similar to that have you um being as a hypnotherapist obviously you've dealt with aliens uh, you've already stated that have you ever had to deal with attaching spirits or a darker forces that are um, demonic or of a malevolent nature have you ever had to deal with anything like that in your lifetime? Very occasionally. Um, I've had it not very often because um, um, it's just been the nature of my work, I think, um, and the way, the frequency that I work on. But um, occasionally I, I have had um, one that, that actually called themselves the Antichrist and tried to scare the living daylights of everybody around. Um, I challenged that and I managed to get them to m move away from inhabiting this particular soul. Um, but it's not something I do regularly at all. I think there are some people that, you know, that seems to be their forte and they, they do a, a fair bit of that. Um, and, and generally it, <clears throat> it's with those, as you may or may, I don't know how much you know of, of that, but Often it's because the person's frequency is in a place where they can latch on. Often if they're in deep fear or they're in, you know, very, uh, which is a very low frequency, which allows them to latch on if somebody is really fearful or whatever. And so they can influence, even if it's not overt, they can influence that person into doing things they wouldn't normally do or whatever. But it's it's not my area of what I call expertise. Generally, there are others that, you know, do a lot more of that than I do. My my work has been mostly assisting people to reach a frequency where they can uh, interact with whoever it is that they're working with on a soul level. Um, and, and that's a frequency that doesn't generally bring in um, a lot of these less, um, these self-serving entities, for want of a better word. So have you noticed... Uh... I noticed you've uh, interacted with people from New Zealand and and Australia and the U.S. and various other countries. Have you noticed any difference in the um, the type of society that Australia is compared to what the U.S. is like? The, the people I know that there are you know good and bad and dark and awesome people in in every country, but. In general, have you noticed any difference between uh, the the freedom of the Australian society versus the freedom of American society or the thought? Maybe freedom is not the word. Maybe it's just the 
the psychology or the way we've chosen to be as a as a uh, country. Have you noticed any different any pattern or difference between the two countries between the U.S. and Australia that that comes to mind if it, when I ask that question? Is that? Yeah, what I would say is that obviously with America being such a vast country, certain areas, it does seem that the society is a lot more open to certain concepts than others in parts of uh, America. Um, I don't know so much about Canada, but in Australia, we've got areas where people are a lot more open to this kind of information and, um, and are prepared to explore it than other parts of Australia. So, you know, where I am, um, you know, in in my kind of area, there's a lot more openness to people admitting they're seeing things in the skies. Um, you know, the, a lot of met, more metaphysical and new agey type of concepts seem to be um, more accepted. In, and yet, if you go down to Melbourne, it might not be quite the same, for example. In New Zealand, it's similar. You've got places where you've got people very open and others that are not. What I did find very distinct was when I was in South America, the openness there was remarkable to a lot of this kind of information. Whereas when I was in Norway and Sweden and Denmark and parts of Europe, they're very closed to much of this stuff. And um, if anything, think it's really um, unhealthy um, and um, you know there's something wrong with you. So, you know, for those, in those countries, it's very hard for them to open up and share their information about their experiences because of the society's response to it. And I always remember talking to a Norwegian lady. She was, um, she was, uh, I, I was speaking there some years ago and I was talking about the attributes of the star kids and what have you. And she came and spoke to me and she said, I'm 79 years old and you're the very first person that's mentioned all these attributes that I have that I've never been able to speak about. And she said, and I, I'm a farmer's wife and I used to call the sheep in with my mind and nobody knew knew how I did it. And she, you know, she was nearly 80 years old and that the first time she'd ever spoken about her experiences. So depending on the um, different parts of the globe and the society um, and programming seems to very much dictate how open generally um, they are to these kinds of concepts that we're talking about. Well, um, I don't know if I've run out of questions or if, I think you're so such a fascinating individual what you do that I, you know, if we got into more detail, we could probably speak all night. But uh, is there anything you know, it feels like we've done an hour and a half, right? Close to it. And yeah. uh, you suggested that you had other things to do today. So I don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, but it's been fascinating having you on my show, and I really appreciate you being here. And But um, is there anything that you feel like you want to say to the audience that you think they would like to hear that's fascinating or... Uh, that would be unique to what you've learned that's that they need to hear uh, is there anything along those lines that you want to say I think what I, I would like to say is that despite what seems to be happening on this planet right now with um, all these different agendas that um, don't seem very necessarily very beneficial to us as a species I do believe that there is a movement uh, um, uh, from higher realms um, of, of beautiful souls coming into this planet and are already on this planet to change it in a way that I think will be unrecognisable from what it is now. And I believe we're on the cusp of that. And I believe very much with what you know um, Robert Dean said before he passed, that we have an amazing future but we've just got to stick with it and trust our, you know, trust that we've come here as part of that to experience it and be part of that new paradigm that I think is the awakening of consciousness on this planet. And so not to get disheartened, I suppose, by what you're seeing, because I do think there is a huge 
change or a shift that's going to happen? Well, there's a there's a book, Mass Dreams of the Future, which gets into mm -hmm. uh, the future. I don't know if you've read it, but um, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people have mm. agreed that the future uh, is on the earth has an infinitely less population than the, than we have now. Mm. And uh, you, we could, some of us can assume that it's through some natural disaster or war or whatever that reduces the population. But um, there's a fellow who um, who talks about the grays a lot. He says, uh, there's 39 gray races contacting us and are around here, and only one is abducting us, and the other 38 are not. And uh, one thing he mentioned was that in the near future, the human race in mass decides to leave the planet. That mm. is, we've made contact we've been given uh the you know hello welcome to the larger community and yeah. most of us chose to split after that so that's not a not any type of mm -hmm. disaster we just all decided to go mm -hmm. and uh so i just thought i would throw that in there considering what you just said mm -hmm. and i do appreciate you being on the show and i really could keep asking you questions if you had all day long to talk but i know you got other things to do and uh, i would always love to have you back if you feel the need or desire to be on my show again and i want to say thank you very much for being on the show and and uh, now i'll go ahead and stop the recording so okay.